Hi, this is Pastor Michael Foster of the historical First African Baptist Church here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We're better known as the Fab Church. I'm praying that you enjoy this sermon that you're about to hear. I pray that it'll be life-forming and life-changing, and that it will meet you just where you are. My prayer is that the Lord will just touch you, and prayerfully this sermon will help lift your spirits and get you to the next level where the Lord will have you. God bless you, and enjoy. Again, I want to welcome all of you who are watching us today. Those of you that are here and watching us build the world wide web, we want to seize an opportunity to welcome you to the First African Baptist Church. We're so grateful and thankful that you allowed yourselves to tune in to us this morning. If you're watching us online, we pray that you make your house, your home, your living room, dining rooms a sanctuary. And when you make that place a sanctuary, it becomes sacred and you can praise and worship the Lord there um, in spirit and in truth. Uh, we pray that you connect with us by simply uh, subscribing and liking us so that you will be able to um, make contact with us whenever something is going on at our church and God bless you and thank you all so much I'm sure that many of you had an opportunity to give while you're right there online with us so that you'll be a part of us even when you're away from us God bless you um, to all those uh, first African Baptist Church members that are all over the world that are watching us um, God bless you and God keep your prayers Today, let us turn to a very familiar passage of Scripture, uh, real, real familiar, and I don't want us to uh, get this Scripture confused with something that is just celebrated at a funeral. Turn with me to Psalms number 23. Psalms number 23, I want to uh, rest your attention. And... Um, have you to place your concentration there. Amen. God bless you. See one of my students. Amen. Good to see you. Uh, put your attention there. Psalms number 23. The verse of reference will be uh, the fourth verse. And when you get to this antiquated and old passage of scripture, so old I'm almost ashamed to preach it. You've heard it so many times and I know that you're about to get ready to just zoom me out because you've read this so many times. But hold your Bibles open. Let's see if I can bring some new insight to an old uh, passage of scripture. In verse 4, you'll find these old and familiar words say, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Some people put an S on shadows like there's more than one. It's just one. Shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Why not? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comforts me. And that's a lot of reading, so I'm going to ask you to be seated. <laughs> a lot of reading. I want to talk this morning from the subject of Surviving Valley Experiences. Surviving Valley Experiences. Uh, turn to a neighbor real quickly, someone that's close to you. You say, neighbor, uh, you must survive the valley. Most of the time we're talking about valleys. Most of the time we are talking about a place that no one really wants to be. No one jumps and shouts saying, I want to be in the valley. Everybody celebrates being on the mountaintop. Nobody wants to be in the place where the sun don't get the shine on you, metaphorically or spiritually. Nobody wants to be in the place of valley because Valley can sometimes be a place of testing. Valley can be sometimes be a place not only of testing, but a valley can also be a place of discouragement. Many a time we talk about valleys in the terms as if valleys are just like a storm. Someone is in one now. Someone is leaving out of one. Or someone is headed to one. Don't think that valleys come in the lives of Christians as punishment. Because God don't send us to the valley for punishment. Sometimes God sends us to the valley so that we may learn. 
And many of us can testify today that, that I am a member of Valley University. <laughs> well, I am getting my credits in Valley because God sends us to school in the valley sometimes, not that we can complain, but God sends us to the valley so that we can grow. Plants don't grow in the valley because the sun don't get that deep into the valley. But the only thing that's parched to grow in the valley is Christians. And Christians can grow in the valley because it's not about whether the sun is on us, the sun is within us. And that helps us to grow in this valley because we have to understand that if God placed us in the valley, then there's purpose behind us being there. Love it. it's important for us today to understand that when we read this text today and when we see David write this text about the valley, we have minimized Psalm number 23 as something we just say and read at a funeral. Talk back to me if you can. But this Psalm is not really about a funeral if you want to be honest. It's about the providences of God. Which means God is more than in just where we are. The providence of God means God is everywhere at the same time. To include the valley. That the valley is in the providences of God. Some of you didn't say amen. Let me say that again. Even the valley is in the providence of God. Which means God has control over the valley. It's not only about providence. It's also about provision. God leads us beside still waters. God takes us to greener pastures and then God, God is a provider and God is a, it, it, it's in God's providence. God is a provider but not only that Psalms 23 talks about God's protection. It's not just something we read at a funeral. It has minimized Psalm 23 as just being death talk. Because we read about this word shadow of death in it. No, it's more than that. It's providential. It's protection. It's, 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 it's provision. God does all those things for us. And guess when David says he does them? While we're in the valley. Can you believe that? Then what that lets us know that, that when we see valley, that we really have to understand the totality of what David speaks about when he talks about this valley. This is just not a time for us to talk about a funeral experience. This is a time to celebrate the goodness of God and how he reacts and responds while we're in the valley. Perhaps today you can't clap, you can't say amen, you can't say much because perhaps just like you and just like me, some of us today, to include you, you're in the valley. You're in a place where nothing really grows. You're in a place where things are chaotic. You're in a place where the sun don't shine metaphorically or the sun don't even shine physically. And I've got good news for you today that if you're in a valley, God still resides in a valley. As we zoom into the circumference of this text, we read about one by the name of David. I won't give you a rich history of background. I won't pull David's resume. Or if you're my mama, I won't pull his resume. <laughs> I won't pull it to tell you about David. Because David is in the hearts of all of us. We all know about David. We know about David from our younger years in Sunday school. We read about David in Bible study. Your teachers in Sunday school taught you about David. All of us know about David. And most of the time we talk about David, if you're a real theologian, if you're that real person who really um, um, uh, persecute people, the first thing you bring up is David messed up with Bathsheba. <laughs> we don't call him king because most of the time we don't want to point out where God was taking him. We want to point out how God had called him. We don't even talk about him with Saul. We talk about that. We don't even discuss David with Goliath sometimes because we're too zoomed in thinking about his indiscretion. But I'm so glad we serve a God that even though David messed up, God still had his hand on him. And if you can't clap about that, you ought to be clapping because guess what? God still has his hands on us even when we make a mistake knowing and when we make a mistake unknowing, we serve a God that keeps his hands on us. 
David here in this text we talk about, it's imperative for us to see what David is talking about. David here now in this, in this story, he starts to talk, talk, talk to us about how he envisions God. David envisions God as being what he and his father Jesse is. That's, it, that's, it, that's interesting. Because since David was a shepherd, he knew the importance of taking care of sheep. His dad had taught him how to take care of sheep. All he knew was how to take care of sheep and smell like sheep. Yeah, so D David understands that he walks with sheep. He talks with sheep. He smells like sheep. And so David understands that David assumes God and ascribes God to be that which he was and his father taught him a shepherd. Wait a minute, isn't that an insult to God that David would say God smelled like sheep, walked around sheep dung and, and went around? David's mind takes him to a place of what it means to take care of sheep. And most of the time when we think about sheep, we think about this white, clean, fluffy animal. That's not really how they look when you get close. Because the reality is when we think about what sheep really look like, they are filthy animal because they are dirty. They rub up against stuff. Stuff stick to them. Mud gets on them and, you, and it's hard for them. They are woolly. They are, they, they, their appearance is white, clean sheep. But the closer you get to them, they're not so white. They're not so clean. If you've ever been around sheep and you get close enough to them, I remember visiting the place. Had, you'll find out that sheep can be can fool you because that's not really how it's like. And sheep has no defense mechanism and sheep has no one to protect them. And David says, I subscribe to you today that the Lord is my shepherd. Why is David speaking in such terminology like being a shepherd? David wants us to understand, I know how hard it is to take care of sheep. I know how difficult it is to work with sheep. I know how they're so skittish and itish that you can't bring them around water that's running because they're so skittish that you have to dig a trench so that they can go down and drink from water. They are very scary. They have no defense mechanism. And they just wander off sometimes and, and you don't know what's going on and you have to leave the 99, go find the one, bring the David. Say, and the Lord is my shepherd. David understands that. That's why he subscribed God to being that which he understands. And you know what David literally is saying? David said, I'm one that wanders off sometimes. And the Lord has to bring me back. I'm one that's skittish and itish. And I get scared when water's running and I'll die of thirst if the shepherd don't get me down and make a trench so I can get beside still waters. You think David said the Lord is my shepherd because of what he is and what he does. That's true. But David is also saying when he said the Lord is my shepherd, David is what David is. You don't read him saying this, I am the Lord's sheep. That's what you don't read. That David says the Lord is my shepherd, but he's also saying I am his sheep. He leads me. He comforts me. He guides me. In other words, David says, I don't even know how to get to green pastures until he leads me to them. David said, I and myself am nothing, but with him I am everything. David says to you and I that there are times when wolves and, and bears and animals are beneath and beyond the green grass. They're waiting in the field. They're waiting in the forest. They're waiting in the green lands. And David is saying, although I can't see them as a sheep, my father, the shepherd, he already knows where they are. Come here, because I think y'all missing this. There are some things designed to kill you, to destroy you, to devour you. You can't even see them, but thanks be to God, that God is our shepherd. Let me get into the meat of this text because this is something very interesting and intriguing. Because if we're going to survive a valid experience, not just, let me say this, not just make it through, but survive it. Now surviving means, wait, watch this, surviving means I don't know how you're going to look when you come out of it, but I know you're going to come out of it. Surviving means you might have to shed some tears, 
But as long as you come out crying, at least you came out of it. Surviving means you might have some bite marks on you, but just what? When the Lord, the shepherd, puts some oil on the bite marks, it's going to soothe the problems. In the, and when the enemy tries to destroy you, because there are times when the enemy tries to destroy sheep, but sheep's wool is so thick, sometimes it don't get an opportunity to pe but pierce the skin. But for us, we're not talking about the skin of, of wool. We talk about what's in the inside of us. So what protected the sheep wool on on the outside, God has placed in us Holy Spirit that protects us while we're on our journey. Lord, have mercy. But listen, you're going to make it through that. you got to understand something. Communication is important in the valley. Write that down. That's number one. Communication is important in the valley. In the valley. Communication is important in the valley. Amen. Uh, so somebody, just, just, just say, you got to talk to yourself. You got to talk. Keep telling you, you got to talk in the valley. You got to talk. You're not going to say it. Just say, don't be quiet then. Say that. Don't be quiet. Don't be quiet. Whenever you get to a valley, you cannot allow yourself to be quiet and act as if you can't open your mouth and talk. Let me, let me, let me see if I can fix this. There's always pre-valley talk, then there's always post-valley talk. It's right there. You'll see it. I'm going to explain it to you. It's right there in the text. There's pre-valley talk, it's verses 1 through, through verse 4. It's pre-valley talk. He's, he's, there's a pre-valley talk that David talks about. I want us to understand something. Before the valley, he talks about God. But in the valley, he talks to God. <laughs> Ooh, you just missed it. Let me wind that back, play it again. Before the valley, we talk about God. But sometimes in the valley, we talk to God. And our pre-valley talk about God is not the same valley talk when we in the valley. Because sometimes we talk about what we're going to do before the fight. But then when you get punched in the mouth, it's a different conversation. <laughs> Pre-talk is one thing. But while you're in the battle, it's another thing. Let me give you what David is saying in this text about this. Before the valley, he talks about God. David says, hey, how is he talking about the God? Because he says, the Lord is my shepherd. About God. He, he says, he said, he maketh me. He, he's talking about God. He says, he leadeth me. He's talking about God. See, this is pre-valley. He's, he's talking, to, he's bragging about God. If I were to push it a little bit, he's boasting about how good God is. He said, he restored. He's talking about God. He says, he leadeth me in the path of righteousness. This is good talk. This is braggadocious talk. He's talking about God. He sounds like Pastor Foster. The Lord will make a way somehow. You just keep trusting and God will do this. God will do. He talking. He sounds like some F-A-B-C bill. God will make a way somehow. You just get, that's pre-talk. That's how we sound before we sign the divorce papers. That's how we sound when that child does come home. That's how we sound uh, uh, pre-counseling. That, that's how we sound before the fight with your sister and y'all ain't talked for six months. That's how you sound, son, before you and your daddy fell out. What do you do when your pre-talk don't mess up with your post-talk? Lord help us. He talks about God at first, but now that he's in the valley, watch his valley talk. When he's in the valley, this post talk, he says these words to her. And this is how what we got to understand. In the valley, he says, you are with me. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Are y'all going to talk back to me? He says, watch what he says. You are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He's talking to the Lord. Before the valley, he talks about God. Now that he's in the valley, he's talking to God. I tell you that the valley will make you stop talking about God. The valley will make you open your mouth and start to talk to God. Watch what he says. You prepare a table for me. Not my waiter. Not my server. You, you prepare. He's talking to God. He's talking to God, to himself. Ooh. 
There has to be communication when you're in the valley. Ask me how I know. There has to be communication in the valley. The worst thing you can do is be quiet. It's okay to talk about God. It's okay to talk to God. But you got to hear yourself talking to yourself about God. You got to hear yourself talking to yourself to God. It's okay what other folks say. But you got to talk to yourself about who God is. has to be some communication. In other words, you got to talk to you and not be crazy. <laughs> you got to talk to you and not be schizophrenic. You got to talk to you in a way that as you talk to God, you encouraging yourself. Y'all ain't, ain't got me yet. When David says these words, he said, you are with me. He's talking to God, but it's coming out of him. And it's going back into him. Lord, help me preach this thing today. And in other words, you won't know God is with you until you open your mouth and start to speak out. Because guess what? Because life and death is in the tongue. And the enemies flee at the name of Jesus. So when you speak out and when you hear you talking, the enemy hears you talking. And one thing that makes the enemy go away is your conversation with God. Lord have mercy. This is scriptorial, but it's also experiential. <laughs> You've got to experience the valley so much till you get to a place where you stop sitting there being quiet and the devil just keep beating up on you. Open your mouth and start to speak to God, talk about God, praise God, chill eating for God. You just got to let the devil know, I'm not giving up on God in this valley. I'm, 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 I'm ready to go. To, thank you. I'm ready to go to number two. First thing is communication is important in the valley. You got to talk to yourself. You got to talk to God. You even got to talk to the enemy while you're talking to God. Let me fix that because I don't want you to miss this. You don't talk to the enemy like he has your attention. You talk to God loud enough so the enemy can hear it. You, you, wait, well, okay, you, you don't get this just yet. Back, back, back down, uh, the Bible teaches us that whenever, whenever uh, 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 the, the Syrians had gone off and, uh, and, and uh, when those lepers was there, the Bible says that when those lepers start to come back and go down into the valley where the enemy was, it sounded like that there was, there was a whole, the, the, the leper sounded like a whole army. <laughs> One but a film, but they were declaring the goodness of the Lord. And the Syrians said, oh, it's a lot of folks coming. And the Syrians took off because the lepers were coming back. They thought, watch this, they thought that it was a great army. But no, it was just because they opened their mouth, God started to magnify their voices. Yeah. You ain't who you think you are. You just open your mouth and what you sound like without a microphone, you might not hear. But when God puts Amplify to it, it's going to sound like you're a whole lot of something, even when you just talking like this. Lord help us. You got to know that when you trust God, God will make a way out of nowhere. He'll amplify the sound to make the devil think it's more of them than of me, and the devil will flee. But I got to tell you something else that you get through this valley. Number, number two, movement. Is imperative in the valley. Movement is imperative in the valley. Uh, so just say to yourself, don't stop in the valley. Tell somebody, don't stop in that valley. Don't stop in the valley. Don't stop in the valley. Don't you do that. Because the minute you stop, you are defeated. And, and verse number four, underline that word, through. <laughs> through, underline that word, through. That is the most important word in verse four. Yea, though I walk through Amen. the valley of the shadow of death. That's the word, through. But, but me, before you go to the word through, he says, I'm going to walk through it. Lord have mercy. That, that reminded me when I was a little boy and I used to head home. Mr. Jones always had this dog that when you walk by his road, he would, he, that, that dog would always just come. And I was always petrified of that dog because that dog was a junkyard dog. <laughs> that dog, I don't know where he got him from. He'll eat metal. <laughs> I saw that dog one time eating grass. He was eating an aluminum can one time. That dog was just, he was a bad dog, I tell you. 
And so every time I would get ready to go home, I would go on the other side of the street, but I would run by real fast because I was afraid. And if I could just get by his fit, get by real quick, maybe the dog wouldn't see me and I could just get away. And once I got two houses down, I could just go, Whew, I made it. But guess what? David says, I ain't running to get through the valley, yea, though I walk. Whoa, that's, wait a minute, that's deep right there. David says, I'm going to walk. That word walk in the Hebrew means steady, slow, deliberate, intentional steps. <laughs> steady, slow, deliberate, intentional steps. David says, I'm going to walk through the valley. And then I was one like, David, no, you, let me take you back to my childhood. You ought to run through the valley and hurry up and get through it. But David says, I can't get through it unless the Lord says I'm through with it. But, but David, you can run and get through it quicker. David said, don't you remember how those children of Israel, how long they stayed in the, in the desert place in the wilderness? The wilderness wasn't nothing. When, the, the trip wasn't long, but they stayed there 40 years. See, the, the Lord kept them there because they didn't learn what they needed to learn. So if they had ran through it, they still wouldn't go make it because they were going to continue to go around in circles. So, beloved, what am I trying to tell you? There are some things you learn in the valley that you learn because you can't go around it, can't go over it, can't go under it. You just got to go through it. And when you learn what God is trying to teach you in the valley, sometimes the valley is this long, but then sometime when you learn, the valley is this long. All based upon what you learn while you're in there. Right. Beloved, can I give you some real, 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 real good um, tools to take? Because some of you have never been in the valley. I can tell the way you look. Let me, let me talk to you, to some folks who, who can testify. Help me out. When you're in the valley... Take you some pens and some paper. <laughs> Don't, well, let me take you some pens and a number two pencil <laughs> in case the pens stop writing. Because there's some stuff God gonna show you while you are in that valley that if you're running, you're going to miss it because you're trying to move too fast. If you run, you're going to miss it. There are some people that God is trying to teach you about. If you move too fast, you're going to miss it before you get married. There are some things you need to learn before you say, I do. There are some things you got to learn before you go get that job. There are some things you got to learn before you try to change that culture. There are some things you got to learn. And if you're in a hurry trying to get through it, you won't see what God is trying to teach you. Amen. Baby, you can do it, but you got to take your time and do it right. Amen. You can do it, baby. God is trying to teach David something. He's, he's, he's walking through slow delivery steps. But then the Bible says, yea, though I walk through, hmm, that's the word I wanted you to underline uh, 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 go on, teach, pastor. This through. If you think you're going to stay there, then you have missed the whole 23rd number of some. See, there are some things you're in right now, you're just in it momentarily. You're just passing through right now. You, the word through means it's not a temporary place, it's not a permanent, I'm sorry, it's not a permanent place. The word through me is just a temporary place. Temporary. It's like, I'm just, I play sports. It's like two a days during the summer in 90 degree weather. It seemed like it won't ever end. But if you just hold on, game day is coming, but you got to first learn to learn to do what you've been trained to do. Some of us, it's like college, and you think you're ready for the job. I just got to get the job. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for the job. I don't even know why I got to go through these four years, these five years. See, I'm all, I, I know what I'm doing. Why do I got to go through this? Because there are some things that you think you're ready for until you get there. 
There are some people you will think you are ready for until you get there. There are some things you will think you are ready for until you get there. Speaking to a young man in my class the other day, and he came up to me after class, one of my classes, and he says, um, he kind of waited until everybody left out. And um, he sweetened the deal because he brought me a little brownie. <laughs> it's a, and um, so uh, from, from Starbucks, and I said, oh, Starbucks, man, you, I don't want it. This is yours. You keep. He said, no, this is, he gave me a brownie. And, um, and I'm, I took the brownie, you know, and I'm thinking like, he done put something in this brownie. <laughs> you know, and I, I went and I looked on my computer. I said, no, he got good grades. <laughs> he got good grades. <laughs> So I'm sitting there, and he said, uh, um, you, 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 uh, you, you a preacher, right? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a pastor. What's... He started to tell me about his valley experiences. Started to tell me about all the things he was struggling with and going through. Then I posed this question, as, and I'm already preparing for this sermon. I posed this question to him. I said, um, I said um, have you learned anything? Yeah, yeah, while you're in this valley... It appears that the Lord has you there. Have you learned anything? Scratch his head. His no answer was all the answer that I needed. But his no answer was also teaching me. The pupil is teaching the professor that could it be today that you're in this valley and this valley ain't ending because you ain't learning nothing while you're in it. You're going through this valley to the other side. You're going through it. That word he's talking about through. Some things you can't go under, you can't go around. Some things you got to go through. And listen, some things in your college experience today, with, I'm talking to some college students, you can't get to it unless you go through it. I know when you first start the job, you want to be the boss of the job, but that's some stuff you're going to have to go through. I know when, you know, some, especially young people, even me as a young preacher, sometimes when I was a minister, I would look at my pastor and i say, why is my pastor doing that? My pastor should do this until I became a pastor. And I, and I went back and repented for everything I said. Because some things you look at and you'll say, it should be done like this or like that until you sit in the seat. And I'm glad about that because sometimes young people have to understand. And that's why now sometimes when I look back over my life, I say, if I'd have had it then without that valley experience, I would have messed it up. And sometimes it takes the valley to really spank you. Sometimes it takes the valley to really get you to the place where the Lord really wants you to be. You can't have a great marriage until you've gone through some stuff together. And some wife elbows her husband and says, did you hear that? <laughs> Sometimes you don't know how good the team is until you lose a good player. Yeah. And God will put you in a position to make you understand that movement is important. You can't stop in the valley because the minute you stop in the valley is the minute you are going to be devoured. God ain't asking you to run but you got to keep moving. Lord, let me hurry up. My time is almost up. He says these words. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death. Shadow of death. The shadow of death. There's three things about a shadow that I want you to understand. Because he's not saying that he's going to walk through death. Just the shadow of it. See, don't, don't, don't. Just take what the test gives you. Don't add nothing to it. Don't take nothing from it. Y'all scared of a shadow. <laughs> he said you're going to walk through death. Or did he? Because y'all look at me like, yes, you did. Did, did he? Through the shadow of death. So what we're really afraid of is the shadow. But don't, don't listen. I know, I know shadows can be, three things about a shadow real quickly. No, number one, a shadow is not the real thing. Right. Have I helped you? Well, say, hey, talk back to me. Right. Look, if it's the shadow of a gun, it can't kill you. It's not the real thing. No, no, that's number one, but number two, I see something else. A shadow always appears to be larger than it really is. 
If I put my hand up here and put light toward my head, by the time my head is reflected off the wall, my hand will be ten, time, ten times the size of my regular hand because the shadow makes things look bigger, larger than it really is. But it's designed to do that. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Not death. Shadow of death. Shadow of death. <laughs> Smells like death, but it's not really what it looks like. It's not really where it appears. That's the first two things. Last thing is this about a shadow. Shadows are only seen in the valley and not on the mountaintop. It's because you're down low that the sun shines down in the valley. And the valley looks, the valley of death looks like it's something greater than what it is, but it's only cast in the valley because when you're on the top, when you're on the mountain, you really don't see no shadows. That's why there's pre-valley talk because you brag about Jesus, but when you get in the valley of the shadow of death, you have to stop talking about Jesus and your conversation, your communication has to turn to Jesus, to God. Amen. So number one, communication is important. Number two, movement is imperative in the valley. Number three, discouragement is not an option in the valley. Discouragement is not an option in the valley. Discouragement is something that cannot happen if you are talking to yourself in God and you keep moving, you cannot be discouraged. Amen. The minute you stop obeying the text, the scripture, the minute you stop talking to God, the minute you stop um, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, the minute you stop is the time you begin to get discouraged. How I know. I'm telling you, experientially. Experientially. You cannot stop. You got to keep going. Got to keep going. Got to keep pushing. Because discouragement can slip up on you at any time. And the minute you are still, the minute you stop progressing and going forward, don't you stop going to school and wait a while because sometimes you won't get back to it. Don't you stop, like I told that young man that was at that school, the, the, uh, at, that, at school. His problem was, he's become embarrassed because of something he's done, and now his embarrassment has forced him to stop. He has become discouraged, and I told him these words, that embarrassment is a tool used by, to, by the devil to keep you from going forward and to discourage you. Yeah, Professor, you really don't know what I did. Don't, I don't have to know what you did. But I will tell you this. Don't allow your embarrassment to lead you to discouragement. What does he say this about discouragement is, don't, is, is not an option? What does he say to that? He says right there in verse 4, he says, I will fear no evil. That sounds like somebody discouraged. Mm -mm. I will fear no evil. Maybe I ain't reading it right, because you ain't. I will fear no evil. When, when, where, where is he saying this at? In the valley. I, while I am in this valley place, refuse to be discouraged in this valley. Wait a minute, don't miss me. I didn't say I won't get hurt. I didn't say I won't cry. But I refuse to be discouraged in the valley. I refuse to be discouraged in the valley. Because the minute discouragement sets in, I'm no longer walking through the shadows of death. Death no longer becomes a shadow. Amen. He says, these two things happen. The reason I know discouragement is not an option, because he leads from fear. Uh, and he moves to comfort. You, you don't see it yet. He says, he says, he says these, he says, for thou art with me, 
Thy rod and thy staff comforts me. You, you still didn't get it. I ain't gonna be afraid. I ain't gonna be afraid, but because your rod and staff gonna bring comfort. I think you, I think I got half for you. Let me try. Let me let me turn the bus around and go back again. I am not going to be discouraged because I will not feel no evil because your rod and your staff is going to comfort me. Wait a minute, David. How can a rod and a staff comfort? That's a good question. Lord, help me answer because I didn't pose the question, did I? <laughs> no, 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 no. David says rod. David says with the rod, Sometimes I get out of place, but because I'm the sheep to the shepherd, if the sheep tap me and tell me to get back in place with the rod, I'm Christian enough to do it. So it don't make me, it don't make me a bad Christian. David said, it comforts me to know I have a shepherd that will tap me back in place. That's the rod, but, 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 but he says the staff. So how can the staff comfort me? David said, because when I wander off or get out of place, sometimes that staff with the big loop on it, he reaches out and get me and pulls me back into place. I don't consider that punishment. I consider that comfort. And so I'm not upset about it. I'm comforted in knowing that God cares for me enough just not to say let him go home. Let him go. No, he pulls me back into place and that comforts me. That's why I'm not fearful. Amen. Moves from fear to comfort. Because he's willing to submit to the shepherd and what if the shepherd get mad and hit me with the rod? David said that's okay because I know he's doing it out of love. David, what is your, just get back with the rest of the sheep. David said, he understands that it's not an anguishing thing. It's a comforting thing. I'm not afraid because I know he cares. I know he cares. I, I know he cares. And since I know he cares, I will not be discouraged in this valley. Well, Good evening, y'all. May the Lord bless you real good. Amen. Because David says, I refuse to be discouraged. Amen. Beloved, now it's time for me to stop talking about David. And start talking to us. Yeah. Some of us have been through some valleys. Yeah. Some of us are in some valleys. Whether we're going through the valley, in the valley, or just come out of the valley. You cannot be discouraged. Because the Lord we serve is so good that he won't allow discouragement. If David would start reading what David wrote, it would be impossible to be discouraged. Ain't the Lord all right? David wouldn't be discouraged, Brother Fred, if David would just take his own words. What words can David take and be encouraged rather than discouraged? Well, maybe David ought to take his words what he says. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and just wither away. <laughs> Ain't the Lord all right? If David would take his own words, David would simply say, I've been young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor see beg of bread. Ain't the Lord all right? If David would take his own words, he will encourage himself. David would say something like, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall always 
be in my mouth. So I can't get quiet. I got to learn how to communicate to God and let God talk back to me. Ain't the Lord all right? David needs to talk to the Lord. And when he take his own words, David will say something like this. The Lord is my refuge and my strength. A very present help in the time of trouble. Ain't the Lord all right? Sometimes, beloved, you've got to take your own words and start to live by them. Ain't the Lord all right? David will say words like this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I feel? Ain't the Lord all right? But David says, Yay! Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that I will, I will feel no evil because the Lord is standing with me. Ain't the Lord all right? If he's all right, you ought to say yes. Say yes. If you're not going to be discouraged, say yes. If the Lord got your hands, say yes. If the Lord can lead you through it, say yes. If the Lord got his hands on you, you ought to say yes. Say yes. Oh, yes. I will not be defeated. Refuse to be discouraged. Discouragement is not an option. But beloved, I got to warn you. It's not an option unless you make it an option. 